They have taken me from the room and put me in irons again. This time they sent an officer of the court, a young man with pox skin and a nervous smile. He's a servant from Kvamur. I recognised his face. When his lips broke apart, I could see that his teeth were rotting in his mouth. His breath was awful, but no worse than my own. I know I am rank. I am scabbed with dirt and the accumulated weeping of my body. Blood, sweat, oil. I cannot think of when I last washed. My hair feels like a greased rope. I have tried to keep it plaited, but they have not allowed me ribbons, and I imagine that to the officer I looked like a monstrous creature. Perhaps that was why he smiled. He took me from that awful room, and other men joined us as he led me through the unlit corridor. They were silent, but I felt them behind me. I felt their stares as though they were cold hand grips upon my neck. And then, after months in a room filled only with my own fetid breath and the stench from the chamber pot, I was taken through the corridors of Storteborg into the muddy yard. And it was raining. How can I say what it was like to breathe again? I felt newborn. I staggered in the light of the world and took deep gulps of fresh sea air. It was late in the day. The wet mouth of the afternoon was full on my face. My soul blossomed in that brief moment as they led me out of doors. I fell, my skirts in the mud, and I turned my face upwards as if in prayer. I could have wept from the relief of light. A man reached down and pulled me from the ground as one rests a thistle that takes root in a place that does not belong. It was then that I noticed the crowd that had gathered. At first, I didn't know why these people stood about, men and women alike, each still and staring at me in silence. And then I understood it was not me they stared at. I understood that these people did not see me. I was two dead men. I was a burning farm. I was a knife. I was blood. I didn't know what to do in front of these people. And then I saw Rosa, watching from a distance, clutching the hand of her little daughter. It was a comfort to see someone I recognised, and I smiled involuntarily, but the smile was wrong. It unlocked the crowd's fury. The servant women's faces twisted, and the silence was broken by a sudden, brief shriek from a child. Fiandi! Devil. It burst into the air like an explosion of water from a geyser. The smile dropped from my face. At the sound of the insult, the crowd seemed to awaken. Someone gave a brittle laugh, and the child was hushed and led away by an older woman. One by one, they all left to return indoors or to continue their chores until I was alone with the officers in the drizzle, standing in stockings, stiff with dried sweat, my heart burning under my filthy skin. And when I looked back, I saw that Rosa had disappeared. Now we are riding across Iceland's north, across this island washing in its waters, sulking in its ocean, chasing our shadows across the mountains. They have strapped me to the saddle like a corpse being taken to the burial ground. In their eyes, I am already a dead woman, destined for the grave. My arms are tethered in front of me. As we ride this awful parade, the irons pinch my flesh until it bloodies in front of my eyes. I have come to expect harm now. Some of the watchmen at Storteborg compassed my body with small violences, chronicled their hatred towards me, a mark here, bruises, blossoming like star clusters under the skin, black and yellow smoke trapped under the membrane. I suppose some of them had no nut on. But now, they take me east, and although I am tired like a lamb for slaughter, 
I'm grateful that I am returning to the valleys where rocks give way to grass, even if I will die there. As the horses struggle through the tussocks, I wonder when they will kill me. I wonder where they will store me, sell me like butter, like smoked meat, like a corpse waiting for the ground to unfreeze before they can pocket me in the earth like a stone. Thank you.